Good evening. A very interesting comet has been discovered. It was found by two American amateurs, Hale and Bopp, and therefore we call it Comet Hale-Bopp, even though its official designation is Comet 1995-01. And here it is. This photograph taken by David Buckley with the one meter telescope in South Africa. And here's another view with the one meter captain telescope on La Palma taken by Don Palaccio. And the magnitude now is about 10, which means it within binocular range. Well, what is so exciting about that? After all, comets are common enough. The reason is that this comet is a very long way away. It appears to be about the same distance from the sun as the orbit of Jupiter. That's round about 500 million miles. And you don't normally see comets as far out as that. So either this is a small comet that's undergone a tremendous outburst, which is not impossible, or more probably, it is a very large comet and it's coming inwards. The trouble is, at the moment, it's a long way south and none too easy to see from here. When Hale and Bopp found it, they weren't looking for comets at all. They were observing the globular cluster M20 in the constellation of Sagittarius, the archer, which is now very low in the south after dark. And below that, uh, they saw the comet quite unexpectedly. It is moving north now, it is brightening up, although unfortunately, from about October, it's going to go behind the sun and we're going to lose it for a, f uh, we're going to lose it for a few months. Well, the point is this. It appears to be shifting in the same path as the Great Comet of 1811. It's not the Great Comet of 1811, one of the brightest on record, which has a period of about 3,000 years. But it does seem to be possibly of the same family, in which case it may become brilliant later on. And inevitably, the prophets of doom were out in force. Will the comet hit us? That middle headline there, end of the world is not nice as more, that I think came from the Daily Express. Well, it's perfectly true, the comet is coming in, it is brightening. But the chances of its coming anywhere near the Earth are very slight. And the chances of its hitting us are so slight that, frankly, you can forget it. So it's interesting, but it by no means alarming. But it just could be spectacular. When we know the orbit better, we'll have a better idea. But in point of fact, it does seem that it may approach its closer to the sun around about April 1997. And before and after that, we just could have a really brilliant naked eye comet, the kind we haven't had for a long time now. And you know, um, I must put a personal note there. Our very first Sky at Night program was April 1957, and we were ushered in by a fairly bright comet, Aaron Roland. I just wonder, will our 40th anniversary in 1997 also be greeted by a bright comet? It's possible, but please don't bank on it, because comets are unreliable things. They're always liable to let us down. Remember Kahootek's comet of 1973. All I'm saying now is that we may have a bright comet later on next year. In any case, even though hale Bop is so low, there's plenty to see in the sky. Jupiter's there, rather low in the south after sunset. And there's a catch I made a few nights ago, seeing the cloud belts and the usual features on Jupiter. And then also there is Saturn. At the moment, Saturn's rings are edgewise on. With my 15-inch reflector, I can just about see them, as shown in that drawing, but not easily. And for the moment, Saturn is shorn of its customary beauty, but it's still very well worth looking at. But this evening, I want to go further afield and talk about the possibility of planets attending other stars. And I begin, as so often, with our friend the Summer Triangle. That nickname I gave many years ago in the sky at night has now come into everyday use. And it's made up of three bright stars, Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, Altair in Aquila the Eagle, and Vega in Lyra the Lyre. And Vega's almost overhead now during evenings. It's the brightest of the three, the fifth brightest star in the sky, and it's blue, which means its surface is very hot. And in that Ron Arbor picture, Vega is there in the middle of your screen. It's uh, 26 light years away and 52 times as brilliant as our sun. It's a lovely star to look at, believe me. But it's very interesting because we now know that Vega is associated with a cloud of cool material which could be planet forming. And this comes from work carried out way back in 1983 by the infrared astronomical satellite IRS, which operated for less than a year but carried out an amazing amount of work in that period and mapped the entire sky in infrared. As we know, light is a wave motion. The color depends on the wavelength. And if the wavelength is longer than that of visible light, we come first of all to microwave infrared and then find it radio waves. So infrared radiation indicates emission from a cool body. Two astronomers, Halman and Gillette, they were testing their equipment and using Vega as a test object when RS was going around the Earth. 
And while calibrating the IRS instruments, they made a remarkable and totally unexpected discovery. Vega had a huge infrared excess. Now, Vega, remember, is a very hot star. And therefore, if it has an infrared excess, it means it must be associated with cool material. And they worked out this cloud of material must extend to 80 astronomical units from the star. And that's a long way. One astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, 93 million miles. Let's put that in perspective. The most distant large planet is Neptune, around the Sun, 2,700 million miles in a bit. And that's on the same scale. And the cloud around Vega was considerably larger than that. And therefore, that cloud of cool material would swallow up the entire main part of our planetary system. And who would know what it was going to be like? Was it going to be clumpy? Was it planet forming? Were the planets there? The overall temperature, about minus 185 degrees centigrade, but no one really knew, but certainly it was there. It was unexpected. And if Vega had that kind of cool material, then could other stars have the same? The IRS astronomers thought so. They looked, and they found them. They found quite a number, including one, Fomalhaut, in the southern fish. Now, Fomalhaut is on view now in the evening. Not very easily from here. It's a long way south, but you can see it. And the best way to find it is to use the square of Pegasus as a direction marker. Pegasus is the main orphan constellation, high in the south now after dark. And the four main stars make up a square, Alpharets, Algonib, and Markab, which are hot and white, and Scat in the top right, which is our orange giant star with a cooler surface temperature. Easy to find, nothing bright anywhere near it, though I must admit that maps do tend to make the square look smaller and brighter than it really is. And below it are two large, dull, zodiacal constellations, Pisces the fishes and Aquarius the water bearer, and at the moment a Saturn is there too. In mythology, Pegasus was a flying horse, and I love these old figures. I'm sorry they were the poor horses upside down, just though he was put there. But it's interesting to look at the square itself. In this Douglas Arnold picture, we see a large number of stars, and many of those are too faint to be seen with the naked eye. But if we dim them down, we are left with the main square stars, and you can see what I mean when I say the square is not really small and bright at all, larger and more extended than one expects. But it can be used to find Fomalhaut, and the way to do it is to take a direction line from Scat, the orange star on the upper right, through Markab, and extend it down through Aquarius, almost as far as the horizon, and there you will find Fomalhaut, 13 times as powerful as the sun, 22 light years away, and like Vega, a white star. And when Fomalhaut was examined uh, with the IRS, it also was found to have a large infrared excess. So near at hand, could it possibly look something like this? Well, it could do. And uh, there were other examples too. But probably the best of all was a star which hasn't even got a proper name. We merely call it Beta Pictoris, and that gives the best example so far, I think. The trouble is that I can't show it to you. The declination is minus 51 degrees, which means that it never rises from here, and from Britain you can never see it at all. But um, I'd like to show you where to find it, if you could, so to speak. And I must start with Orion, which of course you can't see now either, because it's too near the sun in the sky. Orion is our main winter group with the orange-red Betelgeuse and the brilliant white Rigel. Now, extend the line, you will go down over our horizon, so we can't see it, and you will come to a brilliant star in the keel of the ship, Carina, and that's called Canopus. And if you follow the authoritative Cambridge catalogue, Canopus is a real cosmic searchlight, about 200,000 times more brilliant than our sun. The brightest star in the sky, apparently, apart from Sirius. And near that is the obscure-looking Beta Pictoris. A little while ago, when I was out in New Zealand, I took this picture, there is Canopus right in the middle, and to the upper right there you can see Beta Victoris, which is at 68 sun power and 78 light years away, and looking very undistinguished. But now we have not only detected the material uh, by Aras, we've also actually imaged it. And there's an image of the material round Beta Victoris. The star in the middle is deliberately blacked out. You can see the wings of the material coming out there, and they are very extensive indeed. That picture was taken at the observatory of Las Campinas in Chile, this picturesque place, I may say, and the telescope inside this dome with the 100-inch Irene Dupont telescope, one of the best in the world. Now, the cloud round Peter Pictoris appeared to be something like 50,000 million miles in diameter and to be probably only a few hundred million years old, and by cosmic standards, that is not very long. And since then, there have been further developments, this time from the Hubble Space Telescope. And they seem to indicate that there is there a main cloud, something like 9,000 million miles in diameter, 
with another cloud going down to the star. And that impression there, that by Dana Berry, not a photograph, that's a drawing of what it might be like. And if we could go to close range, I wonder, would it look like this? It could do. Anyway, it's there. In 1994, new results came to the La Sierra Observatory, uh, also in Chile. And it now seems that at about 3,000 million miles from the star, the cloud of gas and dust suddenly increases in density. So the inner part is rarefied. And this could be due to an orbiting planet, possibly 20 Earth masses, which sweeps up the inner material. Not conclusive, but at least a possibility. And then there were interesting results dating back to 1981. And it seemed that in November of that year, the star brightened by 2%. It then dimmed down, brightened again, and finally returned to normal. And the suggestion, it's no more than that, is that this was due to the passage of a large planet across the sky, the temporary brightenings being due to holes in the clouds of dust and gas surrounding the star caused by the gravitational pull of the planet. Well, those are interpretations. And it does seem now very likely that there are many stars which are attended by planet-forming material. That does not mean to say that there are planets there. We can't prove that yet, but it's starting to look more and more likely. And that brings us on, you know, now to another point. If there are planetary systems, then what are the chances of there being planets like the Earth and planets which are inhabited? A question we all want answered. Well, I believe the answer is almost certainly yes, and I'll tell you why. Our sun is one of a hundred thousand million stars in our star system or galaxy. And we know of thousands of millions of separate galaxies. You can even see one now with the naked eye. The Andromeda spiral, not very far away from the square of Pegasus, M31. You can just about see it with the naked eye as a dim blur. Binoculars show it well. And telescopes reveal it to be a huge spiral, even larger than our own, containing more than our quota of 100,000 million stars and more than 2 million light years away. So we see it now as it was more than two million years ago. And that's the end of the start. By cosmical standards, even that is close. Now we can probe out to more than 10,000 million light years. And the total number of stars in the universe is staggeringly great. And I, for one, refuse to believe that our own perfectly ordinary, unimportant sun is the only one in all that host to have an inhabited planet going around it. But saying that's one thing and proving it's quite another. So how are we going to find out? One thing we can't do is to go there. Even the nearest star is more than four light years away, one light year being nearly six million million miles. And uh, material travel there is quite impossible. You couldn't do it even if you could go as fast as light. And uh, according to Einstein's theory, which has stood every test so far, you can't do that. There may be ways around it. We've heard talk recently about travel faster than light, but that's not contradicting Einstein. That's involving space warps and time warps and other exotic forms that are totally beyond us at the moment. It may happen one day, certainly not yet. And so far as material travel is concerned, we are limited to our own solar system and there's no intelligent life there except on the Earth. Therefore, the only way in which we can prove the existence of other beings, I think, is by means of communication. And I think, too, we've got to limit ourselves to life as we know it. Once you start talking about life as we don't know it, entirely alien life forms. Well, frankly, you can speculate forever, and it's all rather pointless. Anyway, we do have pretty good evidence that these, uh, these entirely alien life forms don't exist. So really, if we're going to search for life, the idea is to concentrate on finding a planet not too unlike the Earth, going around the star not too unlike the, star, uh, unlike the Sun, and the very nearest stars are not suitable. So where are the two which are suitable? And the two nearest stars that are at all like the Sun, and might therefore be reasonably expected to have planets, are called Tor Ceti and Epsilon Eridmi. And they're visible now. You can see them with the naked eye, they're both about magnitude 3. Let's go back to the square of Pegasus. We found von Hort. Now, if you use the other two pointers, Alpha Bats and Algonib, and use them straight down, you'll come to a bright star called Difter in Cetus the Whale. Don't confuse that with von Hort. Uh, it's about a magnitude fainter and rather higher up. So there shouldn't be any confusion there. And then over to the east of Difter, remember looking south, is Tor Ceti, which is not very distinguished, hasn't even got a proper name. Let's say 11 light years away, smaller, cooler and redder than the sun, but not a bad kind of star. And Epsilon and Eridna, the other candidate, is very much the same. Now, I can't say for one moment that there is a system of planets going around Tor Ceti. I have no proof at all. 
All I'm saying is that there may be. So let's let our imaginations run riot, shall we? And uh, try and work out some method of getting in touch with the beings there if they exist. So we imagine there's a planet down Tor Ceti. On there, there's an intelligent civilization and there are radio astronomers. Now, you obviously can't expect them to understand plain English. Therefore, the only way we could communicate is by the language of mathematics, and we've got to use radio, since radio waves travel at the same speed as light. Therefore, let's try and work out a mathematical code. And we're going to use two kinds of signals. We're calling them 1 and 0. Call them anything you like, plus or minus if you like. And we're going to send out 209 of these. Now, why 209? The reason is that 209 has only two factors, 19 and 11, and mathematicians, wherever they may be, will know that. So we imagine our Tor CTN picks this up, looks at it now, how can we decode this? Only two factors, 19 and 11. Therefore, we'll arrange these in a rectangle, and we'll begin by putting 19 along the top, and they get that. Now, we'll arrange them putting 11 along the top, <laughs> and the result is this. And that, quite clearly, cannot be natural. If we could pick out that kind of signal, we would know there are other intelligent beings there. Obviously, that's an extreme case, I realize that, but attempts have been made, and way back in 1960, the first attempts to listen out at selected wavelengths to those two particular stars were made. The results were negative, and future results, uh, and later results have also been negative. Some time ago, the Americans began SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, using radio telescopes. Sadly, NASA cancelled that on the grounds of expense, but fresh attempts are now being made. And although the chances of success are very slight, they are not nil. And one day, we may be able to pick up signals from other worlds. It will indicate that there really are beings up there. And so, you know, I think it's worthwhile. Next time we go out at night, tonight if it's clear, look up at Vega, at Fomalhaut, and the other million stars up there, and realize that our sun is one of a whole host. And there may well be other intelligent beings up there. And quite likely, at this very moment, someone there is looking at us. One day, perhaps, we may know. Don't forget, if you want our latest information, then dial up our information line, 0891-800-330, or dial up CFAX, page 615. When I come back next month, I'm going to concentrate still upon the solar system, because there are three more planets beyond Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. They're not nearly so well known, but they are fascinating worlds, and I'm going to discuss those. But before I go, I do have one very sad announcement to make. Ever since the very early days of the sky at night, from 1957, one of our great supporters and helpers has been Eric Eilert. He's done our charts, done our moving models, been a tremendous helper and a tremendous inspiration all the way through. Well, very sadly, following an operation, Eric Eilert collapsed and died and you can imagine how sad we all are. He's not going to be forgotten. He's going to be very badly missed indeed. And so, Eric, thank you indeed for all you did.